first of all, I want to I want to thank uh, the Secretary General and uh, APO for this uh, invitation. I'm quite honored to be here, and it's been wonderful to be back in Japan. I've spent the the week here, and despite a lot of rain and uh, earthquake two days ago, I've had one of the best times of my life. So why, in a conference on productivity, why, why are we talking about government? Why, why does government even matter when you think about productivity? Well, in all sorts of ways, government can help facilitate productivity in the economy and society, and, or it could be a deterrent. To it. it. And so how government is and whether government, whether you modernize government or not, matters a lot. Think of a, a few historical examples. So back in the 1800s, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, they had what were called red flag laws when automobiles first uh, came out. And that what that meant was that the cars could go no more than two miles an hour in the city. Um, and you actually had to walk out with a red flag beforehand in front of the cars. Now, one of the most infamous proposed laws uh, actually said that if you saw livestock coming up, you actually had to disassemble the entire car so you wouldn't, so you wouldn't scare the livestock and hide the pieces of the car in the bushes. Now, that sounds very funny, but in fact, these kind of laws actually delayed the automobile industry for a number of decades. Another example is the factory model of education. It originated in Prussia all the way back in the 1800s. And in many countries around the world, this sort of assembly line model of education continues despite the fact that we're moving towards a world of personalization. And I would argue that this is held back productivity in the economy. Now on the other side, government can play a huge role in actually helping to stimulate and facilitate productivity and innovation in the economy. These were some life-changing innovations. All of these innovations, touchscreen TVs, microchips, Google search, the internet, wind energy, supercomputers, barcodes, infant formulas, and dozens and dozens of others were initially funded thanks to government research and development money. So government matters a lot. It matters a lot when you're talking about innovation and productivity, and it especially matters today. Why? Because we have these technologies that are proceeding at an exponential pace. Um, they are not leveling off so far. They're basically doubling all the time, and at the same time, we have a government that's oftentimes largely stuck in a, in a world that is further away. And the question is, how do we close that gap? Close that gap between these technologies and where government is. So let me start by going through a few different areas I think that are really critical for this. And the future one, the first one is looking at the future of work. So I'm going to talk about it in general, and I'm going to talk about it how it applies to government and also government policies when it comes to automation and other areas. So we are right now in what's called the AI spring, the artificial intelligence spring. Um, that was after a number of decades in the 70s and 80s of being in the AI winter. So what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is the AI winter was when that all of the advances in artificial technology, artificial intelligence were just around the corner, but they never seemed to quite come, and many companies went bankrupt trying to do it. But today, we are actually in the AI spring where we're seeing remarkable advances across the spectrum of these artificial intelligence or cognitive technologies. Now, I think the iconic moment in many respects when we saw this from a cultural standpoint was a number of years ago when in the, in the US, Ken Jennings, who was the greatest Jeopardy game show player that ever lived, he won like 90 times in a row, when he played against IBM's Watson computer in Jeopardy. Um, how many of you remember that occurring? It was kind of a worldwide event. Now, the funny thing about this was, this was the first time you know, playing against a computer. Well, what mo most people don't know is that the 
computer was so big, IBM's Watson, that they couldn't actually play this in the Jeopardy headquarter, in the Jeopardy studios. They actually had to do it in the, in the IBM um, headquarters up in upper state New York. And so this Ken Jennings was playing against the computer and imagine he was looking out at an audience similar to this, but in the audience was only IBM engineers who had actually helped to build Watson. So they weren't exactly cheering for him. And as he mentioned then, he said, I was playing in front of a crowd that wanted to see blood. It was an away game for humanity. Uh, and of course, he ended up losing, uh, losing to Watson. And subsequently, we've seen computers be able to beat the greatest Go player with AlphaGo one. And you, I'm sure you've heard of that recently too. So when we talk about cognitive technologies, um, we, it's important to understand that we, there's many different types. There's about 15 different kinds of these technologies, and it's under, important to understand what they're doing. We've got speech recognition, which is getting better and better and better, and of course, that's helping when you're calling in and you're actually talking to a computer. And they were just had a demonstration with Google Assistant where it was indistinguishable from a human being. Then we have machine translation, and this is essentially translating um, text into another language. Now, we've seen really remarkable advances in this just over the last year. Um, one of the big cases, interesting one, was, was around the translation of a, some great American text, the Great Gatsby, into Japanese. And originally, the translations were not incredibly good, and there was a University of Tokyo professor who was following all this. He, he ran the computer lab for human-machine interaction, and then overnight he saw all this social media where it jumped in advance and got better almost by a leagues much better in real time. And what happened was that the computers were actually learning from themselves, essentially, what's called deep learning. And so the ability to translate text, um, speech, into different languages has gotten so good that we're doing a project in Korea right now where typically we would have needed translation, translators for this. We're using basically all Google Translate for it. Rules-based systems essentially have been around for a little while and they're based on decision trees. Machine learning, I'm gonna talk more about it, is one of the most important forms of cognitive technologies. Robotics. Uh, where you have here in Japan probably the leader in the world in using robotics. Computer vision. Now that's facial recognition and other areas. That's again where it's gotten so good. Computers are actually better at humans now at recognizing face, faces and recognize people and at recognizing emotion. Why? Because computers can actually see all those really small movements in your face, and increasingly, computers can tell whether someone is lying or not by your facial expressions. The leader in computer vision right now in the world is in China uh, because of all the cameras that they have that are all equipped with facial recognition in them, and so they're getting a lot of training set data coming through that's very controversial in some respects, but they're actually being able to make leaps and bounds on that because of all the training data that they have going into it. And lastly, natural language processing, which is essentially taking text, where there's a lot of text that we have, and turning it into data. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. Now, a way to think about artificial intelligence is it's really the new electricity. So electricity changed everything. Electricity changed how work got done, it changed households, it changed society, it led to the second industrial revolution, of course. Now, it took a while, essentially, for organizations to figure out how to take advantage of electricity, but the ones that did it the most quickly were the ones that had a competitive advantage. It's going to be the same thing with AI, but the way to think about it is Everything will be smart. AI will be embedded in just about everything, similarly to electricity, and it will have as a transformative effect. And when you, th when you think about productivity, economists who look at this believe that we're gonna see the same kind of productivity increases from AI as we did see from electricity. It's gonna take a little bit of time because you need to figure out how to reorient all of your operations. So the, the question that companies all over the world are asking is this. How do we get five times, 10 times the output 
that we have today with the same resources. Now that's a remarkable jump in productivity, but I know all of the different companies we're working with at Deloitte, that's the kind of questions they're asking, and they're investing billions of dollars overall in cognifying, taking all those technologies and cognifying their processes. So we are completely transforming our audit process, how we do audit, how we do tax, and how we do consulting, hundreds and hundreds of different projects, and injecting machine learning, natural language processing into them, and every company is doing the same. Because, and so the question is, what are the big shifts that are needed as we look at this? So when you think about the future of work, Every aspect of work is going to be redesigned. From work to the worker being augmented to the workplace and so forth. Everything is going to change in a similar way as it changed in the second industrial revolution. Now, this is hard to see, but the way to think about it is done, we've done this kind of pyramid. So the first thing when you look at work, it's the application of a lot of these autonomous systems cognitive technologies, also robotic process automation where we're going to be automating a lot of manual tasks um, and hybrid, that changes work. And it's a shift in the jobs. They move from just content to more understanding context. And for more the mind to machines, we're gonna have this kind of blend of human and computers together. Workers, so right now, your workforce might, might be your current workforce and maybe you have some consultants working for you, but in the future, it's going to be your workforce, essentially your contingent workforce around the gig economy. Um, it will also be crowds using crowdsourcing to involve the crowd, and lastly, digital labor. Robots and digital labor essentially will be a part of everyone's workforce, and you will onboard them in a similar way as you onboard real people. We're already doing that in companies around the world. There'll be a shift in pr production from somewhere to anywhere, thanks to Industry 4.0, thanks to additive manufacturing and so forth, you're, we're going to be producing uh, manufacturing very, very different ways than we've seen before. Uh, and lastly, in the workplace, this notion of how you hire people, how you staff them up, their performance ratings, and a lot of that, we're gonna be adding this sort of machine learning cognitive layer to that to help to make better decisions, and it's going to require different leadership models. So I think that what I just wanna emphasize is work is going to be thoroughly, thoroughly transformed and not look anything like it does today in just a decade or two from now. Now this is a Tesla factory. Now Tesla factories are known for being highly automated factories. Now, in, and the joke is that in, a, in one of these factories, there's just one person and a dog. Now, the individual, the person's name, the human's job is just to feed the dog, and the dog's job is to keep the human away from the machines in the first place. Um, but this notion of what we've seen in factories now, this kind of level of automation precision, is now moving out into the real world. And from kind of blue collar factory jobs actually to white collar positions. So what is going to be automated and how do we to think about this? So first of all, all the tasks that are kind of dull, manual, menial, and so forth, which is a, about 30%, 35% of activities in many organizations will be automated over the next few years. Another thing that's going to, we're gonna be using computers for and robots and others is things that are very dangerous. We're already seeing bridge inspections and understand that we're, there, we're using drones for it. Here in Japan, the use of robotics in disaster response in emergency situations. We're seeing it a lot in policing also. Um, and then lastly, what's dear? Things that are really, really important is th are things that we're going to be augmenting human capabilities and extending our capabilities using computers to do. Now we did a, the first ever major analysis that we know of of, 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 of a government organization, the US federal government, to understand how people spend their time today and what could potentially be automated. And no one had ever looked at how they spend their time. And if you look at this, on the, a lot of the activities, 
that people spend their time were actually kind of paperwork activities, things like documenting and recording information, getting information, passing information back and forth. Those are the kinds of activities, really, that are paperwork-based, not always important, and computers can do well. We did an analysis, and we found that four, four out of five of the most labor-intensive activities have 50% or more um, medium to high automation potential. Four out of the top five activities, and that's essentially hundreds of millions of hours being spent on those activities. And so we said, okay, what about what would the potential labor savings being where you can basically take labor doing low value activities and move it to more high value activities if you were to invest a lot in automation and AI technologies? We found with a high investment, 1.1 billion hours out of 4.3 billion hours. So that's essentially like a day a week of everyone's time could be shifted to more high value activities simply by automating a lot of things that are easy to automate where the technology is there today. With a low investment, a lot more. But think about in your organizations, if you could free up everyone in your organization a day of their time a week to do something more valuable, how transformative that could be. And that's, that's what the future holds out. And that's where I get to the 5x or 10x kinds of productivity improvements that a lot of organizations are looking at now. So the way to think about kind of the future of work is that we're going to be freeing up maybe 25 to 30% of a lot of labor hours right now um, by using automation, things like robotic process automation and other tools. Um, but then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be extending human capabilities by actually equipping people with the ability to use a lot of the artificial intelligence technologies to be able to do things that today are not possible for humans to do. And I'm going to give you some examples in a few minutes. And the result is, I think, a really super empowered worker. Now, we have a project right now where what we're doing is looking at what are some of the jobs of the future? that are possible. And what we're doing is we're breaking down, decomposing how work gets done today, and then we're applying a lot of these technologies and new business models to it and say, what do the jobs look like then in the future? And we started to build some of these out already. And we have everything from what's their LinkedIn profile to what's a day in the life look like? Because what we want to do is help to people to envision the future that they want to live in and not say that we're all just going to be victims of an automation future that puts people out of jobs. And we actually have the ability to create the future we want. So these are a few of the ones we've started to develop. A mobility platform manager. And as was mentioned earlier, Japan is one of the leading mobility systems in the world. But what would that look like? Or a criminal redirection officer, where you're redirecting people so they never go to prison in the first place. And what sort of tools would they need? Another one is talent cloud coordinator, where essentially what we're looking at is a, a lot of times employees would actually lie in a, more of a cloud, like a consulting staffing model. And depending on what the needs were, you would pull them down and they would work on projects for a certain amount of time. Now, lastly, when we think about future of work, um, the question that always comes up is this very big fear about automation and people losing their jobs. Some of the reports are anywhere from 40% of all the jobs are going to go away over the next decade, all the way down to what OECD recently said, which was really maybe 8%. Um, so we don't really know. But what we know from history is that in every single other technological revolution, we created more jobs than we lost. But oftentimes, that took a while to happen. In the second industrial revolution, I mean, it took decades and decades and decades for workers to get back to where they were before. So every government is going to have to have a whole series of sort of um, policies in place to deal with this. And I think the most important key to competitiveness over the next 10, 15 years is going to be your ability to rescale your population. Talent is going to be key in that ability to reskill the population en masse. And you know what? We haven't seen this done before. 
It's going to evolve, the private sector is going to be very important, some government programs. The biggest example we have in the US now is a telecom company, which is AT&T, which is, they've basically said 100,000 of their employees who did technology work, their skills are not what they need for the digital age. But rather than laying them off, what we're going to do is we, they're going to commit to reskilling those employees. So you, a lot of other things we need to do is really refocus the workforce development programs around business needs, promote lifetime learning. We're no longer the case where you're going to be able to go to university and then not learn. It's going to have to be a continuous thing. And the notion that universities are just for people 18 to 22 years old is, is crazy in today's world. So there's going to need to be a lot of changes that occur. Next, let's look at the future of decisions, predictive government. And a lot of this applies both to government and the private sector. So I talked a lot about augmentation and extending. And one of the things computers are much better at doing than humans is actually prediction. Uh, we're not very good at that. Um, human to machine prediction and what's called the hippo problem, which is the hippo problem is the highest paid person in the room where we look to make decisions, and oftentimes those decisions can be wrong or the most advanced. William Grove, a professor of psychology at the University of Minnesota, he did an analysis, 50 years of data in the medical field where he compared head-to-head -head approaches, humans compared to machines, and found that people were superior only 6% of the time. Another professor, Philip Tetlock, a very famous political scientist, he basically asked 284 people who are considered the experts in their field, the very best in their field, um, and he analyzed a lot of their predictions about political and economic trends. Um, 82,000 predictions from the top experts, and what did he find? He found humanity barely bests a chimp throwing darts at the possible outcomes, okay? So why are we so bad as humans at making predictions? Why? Because we all have cognitive bias. We make predictions based on gut instinct or what happened in the past to us as individuals, um, but that's basically, that's a biased sort of decision. And a lot of very, very big problems in the world are caused by biased human decision making. And so the idea is to supplement our decision making uh, and our, by using computers, which can analyze millions and millions of pieces of data um, that are way beyond our individual experiences to help us to make better decisions. So, you know, a way to think about it is we're moving from human to centaur where essentially we are going to be augmented by computers in all sorts of different ways. Here's a way to think about it. So if you recall, it was about 20 years ago or so when Bobby, um, 20 years or so when Gary Kasparov, the best chess player, master chess player, lost to IBM's Big Blue. Now, and since then, humans have not been able to beat computers at chess. Yet they've been doing other experiments lately. And the experiments are other competitions. It would involve a master chess player, the computer, and then a group of good chess players augmented with computers. And they would play each other. Every single time, the humans working with computers have won that. And that's really the future. It's the human to machine working together. By the way, that's an area where here in Japan, there's a lot of amazing work going on, both from a design standpoint and other areas, looking at this notion of human to machine interaction and how do we design that interaction better. Uh, another example is, again, in, in medicine, IBM's Watson can synthesize data from over 200 textbooks, 290 medical journals, 12 million pages of text to shed light on treatment methods that no single human could find on their own. So think about all sorts of different occupations being augmented by the ability to tap into that kind of data. And that's where I think we're going to see. That's where we are moving. Um, and another example of this, which takes it to another level, is in the US Air Force. <clears throat> 
Um, there's a group that, so the Air Force trains, has to train fighter pilots. And the group that just went through, <clears throat> fighter pilots are, have to be under all sorts of very high stress situations, but it's very expensive to send them always out in the planes and to do those sort of experiments. So what they did was they were working with an organization, a startup called Sensei. And what they do is they put them under virtual reality and they put them in all of these high stress sort of situations and then they want to see how they're reacting to those. But you know what they're doing? They're actually reading their brain waves at the same time and watching where they have problems, where they're good and so forth. And then they're designing curriculums um, based exactly in syllabus is based on how how they do well and bad. So essentially, they're using AI to develop these very, very personalized models um, to help these individuals to improve. The first group of fighter, Air Force fighter, fighter, fighter pilots just went through this just a few weeks ago. Um, and so if you think about our roles, we're all going to have kind of AI advisors that are going to help us uh, play out various policy outcomes. I know there's a number of individuals here from embassies. So think about like being involved in kind of diplomatic situations and others, and before you go into a meeting, before you go into a high-stress situation, being able to call on the AI to help you play out various scenarios that may, that may be occurring to, again, help you to make better decisions. So we're gonna be moving from kind of an on-demand economy to more of a predictive economy, using computers and so forth to help us to make better predictions. Next, I wanna talk about regulation. Uh, probably no area more important to productivity uh, for all of you. I just came out with a paper a few weeks ago looking at the future of regulation. Deloitte just put it out, uh, my center did, and what we wanted to look at was this. Technological developments like artificial intelligence, machine learning, sharing economy, autonomous vehicles, distributed ledger technology, um, fintech, and various things are creating a lot of challenges for regulators. Um, you cannot regulate in a traditional way. Why? Because the regulatory process is too slow. These technologies are getting advancing at such a level that regulators are having a very hard time keeping up. So they're having to look at different regulatory models to actually stay up. So what are some of the challenges for regulating these emerging technologies? Um, they really fall into business challenges and then technology challenges. And quickly, one is the pacing problem, which essentially is just that regulation usually takes, it takes years. And by the time the regulations come out, the technology is totally transformed and changed. And so you have basically a unicorn sort of for, um, startup that's able to reach hundreds of millions of customers and so forth within a year or two, and the regulatory process has just started. So this pacing problem has gotten worse, where you have sometimes the policy time is maybe five to 20 years, and yet these startups are able to basically create these new business models and have customers within a year or two. You've also got disruptive business models. So think about your an Uber or sharing economy sort of thing. You start off, and you're regulated maybe by transportation because you're just, um, you're, you're basically have passengers in your car, but then what if, what if you want to start delivering food like Uber Eats, then you're regulated by another entity, or if you decide that you're going to have helicopters, Uber helicopters, then it's an aviation entity, and then so who's actually regulating these models as they change and transform very quickly? And then there's a variety of different technology, um, technology challenges. Uh, one of them is around privacy and data issues. Some of you may have seen the European Union put out their GDPR uh, regulations about data and privacy that also included around artificial intelligence um, that are fairly restrictive in all sorts of ways and they require companies to do a lot more in terms of letting people un know what, they, what, they're actually, what data they're capturing and letting them opt out. And then there's a variety of challenges around artificial intelligence, like black box problem. Do we know what's in the algorithm that's making all these decisions for us? Is there racial bias involved in it? And so on. So how do you think about this as a regulator? 
And for all those of you who are working on productivity, how could you influence regulators and what's, help them think through this area? So you think about it as a four-stage process. And the first stage is the pre-regulatory process, which is around these different technologies, you need to understand first, what are the regulations that might currently apply? Not directly, but looking across, and it turns out that a lot of times we don't actually know that answer. Um, no one's reviewed it. We used natural language processing and machine learning to analyze all the regulations in the US Code of Regulation, um, hundred, hundreds of thousands of them, and we found 68% of all the regulations have never been edited, updated once. Um, and we also found that in many re respects that a lot of them were duplicates of each other. So it's understanding what do you have now before you start a regulation because sometimes you might not need new regulations in some areas because old ones will apply. Secondly is testing and evaluation. The question is when do you regulate? What you want to avoid is the too slow to regulate problem or the too fast to regulate problem, and that's a very difficult one to do. So increasingly what governments are doing is having a more adaptive sort of regulation. A lot of governments here are starting up what are called regulatory sandboxes, especially in the FinTech area, we're also seeing it with autonomous vehicles, where they're saying, you know what, these are controlled environments, they're allowing innovators to test new products that might be illegal under today's regulation, um, without having to follow all the standard regulations because they want to understand the technologies and they actually want to help these innovators. So we've got innovators, accelerators, and sandboxes, and we're seeing a lot of this certainly in the financial technology area around fintech companies. So here's an example right now. You know, we found over 30 different regulatory sandboxes around the world um, that were just, do, just in, within the finance, fintech area. This is a very, very different model. What this says is we're going to provide a kind of controlled environment and let people experiment, and we're going to watch them very closely, and we're going to try not to regulate too early before we totally understand what those organizations are doing. Um, so you, the next stage is how, do you, how to regulate. What kind of regulation makes the most sense? And there's a wide spectrum there. A wide spectrum from minimal to almost no regulation or relying on common law principles, so forth, all the way to what's called like a very heavy precautionary regulation approach, which is basically saying that we want to prevent any harm to consumers and the innovators are gonna to have to prove that there's no harm there. And between that, there's a very, very big spectrum. And the thing I want to emphasize right now is around these emerging technologies, there's something that's going on which is called, you can call, think of it as innovation arbitrage. And that means that innovators are going to those countries that have kind of the best regulatory environments for testing that out. We're seeing this playing out in area after area. So what we're doing now is we're kind of looking all over the globe at what these regulations look like. So here's an example from unmanned aerial systems or drones. We've got two major approaches to regulation. One, which is more allowance, saying we're going to allow these things to occur. And then there's another one, which is more restrictive sort of approaches. And what you'll find is actually that makes a big difference in where companies want to locate for doing this. In the US, we had a more restrictive approach to drones for a while, and we and Amazon and other companies would actually have to do their testing outside the country. And we actually, we lost out in many respects to other countries because of the regulatory approach, which has now been changed. So, and this is playing out, um, whether it's around things like genetic testing, or we're seeing it with drones, we're seeing it with autonomous vehicles, we're seeing it with FinTech. If you don't have a regulatory environment that's more favorable to this and one that's very restrictive or where there's not a lot of clarity involved, then those companies that are testing these will go elsewhere or they will avoid your country. We're seeing this again and again with these emerging technologies. So we came up with five principles uh, for the future of regulation and how do you need to change how we regulate? These are very different models than the traditional models of regulation, but we're seeing in country after country much more willingness from regulators to adopt these kinds of models. I don't have time right now to go through all of them, 
But it's one of them, so think about, you're shifting from regulate and forget, which is what we see, we saw the fact that 68% of all federal regulations were never updated, to one which is more iterative and responsive, and looking at what's called soft law approaches as opposed to hard law. We're seeing a lot more collaborative regulation, which is around working with industry, working with associations to try to come up with regulatory approaches. An example uh, right now around the data privacy issues is APAC has basically set out a series of guidelines for companies to do, and they're guidelines, so they're more soft law as opposed to hard guidelines, but it's working with industry to try to get that to happen. Outcome-based regulation, which is shifting from performance and results, um, sort of an outcome-based approach, as opposed to trying to tell the, the um, industry exactly how to meet all their regulations. And lastly, risk-weighted regulation. I want to say a word on this, because I think we're going to see a lot more of this. In many countries, if you go into the airports, um, you're able to go through fast-track systems because you've given a lot of your data already. Um, to the authorities. And then in the US we call it um, pre-check or global entry. And what we're starting to see is that sort of a model playing out in the regulatory area. So it's basically saying if you are a company, you're able, if you give us your data ahead of time and you let us check you as a company, we can give you kind of a gold star, silver star, bronze star, and basically fast track some of the regulatory approvals and so forth. We're, um, and the, the Food and Drug Administration right now, the FDA, is, uh, in the US is trying to figure out how do they regulate uh, digital health? Um, because essentially a lot of times health is now on our phones. So how would you regulate that the, compared to other medical devices? Because what's happening is with digital health, you have updates coming all the time. So how do you regulate that? Well, what they're doing is they're saying, instead of trying to say for each update, it's impossible that we're going to approve it or not, we're gonna look at the company and we're gonna pre-certify certain companies as good actors, essentially, and then we're gonna be doing continuous monitoring on them. So it's a really different model of thinking about regulation. Um, another thing is, so when you think about these technologies, these are technologies that regulators can use to dramatically change how they regulate, to make regulation, to, more, to make them more efficient, more effective, and to reduce friction, reduce compliance burdens on business. So we're looking at how do you use all these different tool books to transform, revolutionize regulation. One example is, as I mentioned, we have something in the US where they're, that President Trump is trying to reduce regulation. And one of the things they're trying to figure out is, okay, how do you know which regulations to actually reduce? Which ones are no longer needed? Which ones are duplicative or redundant or archaic? Well, it's hard for humans to understand all that because there's so many. So what we did was we built a model that actually looked at all of the regulations and using text analytics, we were able to look at which regulations uh, were obsolete, outdated, duplicative, or overlapping, which ones had not been updated for a number of years, which ones connected to each other, and, and we are able to do that with every single agency, and that's the sort of tools that regulators are gonna have the ability to use right now. In the EU right now, they just uh, put out a tool where they were looking at different companies and, and how they were adhering or not to the new data privacy regulations, and they used, again, machine learning to go through all of the different companies and what they had said, and they were able to find some issues. So again, regulators are another area where go they're going to be augmented through these sort of technologies. And I think you've got a really great opportunity to reduce compliance costs and reduce friction between government and companies by using a lot of these tools. Let me end with looking at the overall thing about government and a different way of thinking about government. I wrote a book uh, called The Solution Revolution, How Business, Government, and Social Enterprises Are Teaming Up to Solve Society's Biggest Problems, which looked at this whole different sort of group of organizations we've seen all over the world which are trying to solve public problems that are not always government or organizations. And how does government take advantage of all of that investment and all of that to leverage it to create more public value? 
Because as Bill Joy has said, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. So how can government work much more and find that mutual advantage with the private sector to advance public goals? And we're seeing, so the way to think about it is a government that's more open functionality. So you might need a new capability or to solve a problem in a new way. Um, so a way to think about it is not how do we build it ourselves, but maybe the first question is can we borrow it? Does such a capability exist in the private sector? Can we fund it? Can we incentivize it? What are the sort of capabilities that we can harness, whether it's talent, technology, investment? In the US right now, the top five technology companies spend close to $60 billion a year on research and development. A lot of that is around areas like artificial intelligence and so forth. So how can government actually take advantage of that, that sort of thing and actually look at that as creating public good through different sort of partnerships? So there are really five different roles that governments can play in this area. Um, number one is problem solver, which is more traditional, where they're going to solve the problems themselves. Another one is enabler, where by providing investment dollars, almost acting as a venture capitalist, they're actually helping to enable the kind of innovation that they need that will create more public value. Convener is another way that governments can play in these innovation ecosystems, which is a more traditional role. Motivator. Um, governments all over the world are creating prizes and challenges and setting up competitions and doing things like that in order to try to create, have the outside world help them to solve problems. And lastly, is it's an integrator. So Ryan's going to talk about transportation problem. And when you think about a lot of the transportation issues we have around the world now are, are really issues of how do we get more people to carpool or bike ride or off the road, and government can play an important role convening and integrating the automobile companies, the technology companies, the transportation providers, all into trying to solve that problem. A couple examples of how to think about this new role of government. A lot of development organizations are now saying that we are going to play this role of enabler, and we're actually going to invest in companies and startups and other organizations in developing countries to, that will help us to answer and solve some of these development challenges. This is one of the organizations, and this is how they invest that they're in their innovation portfolio. They say 70 to 90% of all of our innovation efforts should be improving the known, but then 10 to 30% would be inventing the new. And they create, have a portfolio, just like a venture capitalist might have a for portfolio where they're always investing in those different ways, again, because they're trying to solve different public problems. Another example is by actually bringing startups and organizations in and working with them in government. The city of San Francisco has an entrepreneurs in residence program where they get about 300 applications from different startups to come to work in the city for about eight, nine weeks at a time, and they've set up an incubator, and they work with different departments, and they actually get real live business cases around things like Internet of Things or artificial intelligence. It doesn't cost the city anything, really. They're not paying them, but what the startups are getting is use cases that they can take to other cities. One example is Indoors, which was a company that does indoor GPS, global positioning system satellite. And essentially, what they're doing there is they're trying to make it easier for blind people to navigate airports by use bringing GPS in. And that's a great use case that they can use elsewhere. Again, they're saying there's so much happening in the startup community. How do we help bring that in to make government more innovative? Another example is around passenger screening. Um, our Transportation Security Administration at Department of Homeland Security actually said, how can we improve the algorithm that we use around threat recognition? Now, usually they would just hire a firm to do that or they would do it in-house. What they did was they set up a challenge and they put it out to the world to help them improve their current algorithm uh, for this. Now, that's a pretty amazing thing. We've done over 700 of these sort of prizes and challenges just in the U.S. federal government alone. We're opening up government problems for the private sector, for the world to help solve. Lastly, this is one from IARPA, which is our, one of our intelligence agencies, which actually works on innovation. 
And they actually said, because again, we've talked about humans having a hard time doing prediction, how do you create a method to predict future political, geopolitical outcomes that is better than current state of the art methods? Now this is an intelligence agency going out to the world to say, help us create a better model. And why? Because the crowds can be incredibly effective and you're reaching people who you might not reach otherwise. So let me, let me end, end with this, is that um, government matters a lot. Government modernization matters a lot. I've been working on government reform for 30 years now, three decades, written nine books about it, thousands of studies, and what I worry about right now a lot is I really worry when the gap between the cutting edge in the private sector and what's going on in government gets too wide. And I think in some places we're seeing that gap widening a lot. And it's incredibly important for productivity, for your society, for, the, for that gap to close. And government's going to do that. Government's going to have to modernize. Government's going to have to change considerably and fundamentally in a similar way we're seeing in the private sector. And as we go through that journey, just remember that people are very open-minded about new things as long as they are exactly like the old ones. Um, so thank you very much, and I think we have some time for some questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Eggers. Oh, and I did put my email and Twitter up. If you want to put that back up there, if anyone wants to email me, if they could put it up on the screen. OK, any? we would like to open the floor for questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. And please state your name and affiliation before asking questions. OK, so that gentleman over there. Um, we will bring a microphone to you. Thank you very much for an extremely eye-opener presentation. Uh, here we do have a combination of almost both the worlds, a developing world as well as the developed world. And while the developed world, to a very great extent, is quite open to these changes, artificial intelligence, big data, or so on, however, we understand that the mindset in the developing world is not so open to changes in the regulations. Do you have any suggestions where we can collaborate with the developed world so that these changes in regulations embedding these new technologies can be adopted as early as possible? Uh, that's a great question. And um, I, did a, I did a session uh, with the UN Secretary General and a lot of the heads of the UN agencies uh, where we're looking at innovation and, and trying to answer those sort of questions uh, just a few weeks ago in London. So I think there's, there's a number of opportunity areas. Um, so the first opportunity area is around leapfrogging. And a lot of you have heard about that, but essentially, over the last three, four decades, the developed world has spent hundreds of billions of dollars on big, kind of huge and expensive technology systems, legacy technology systems, using cobalt and other sort of areas, and multiple iterations of it um, that you will not need to use in much of the developing world. You'll be able to move directly to the cloud and software as a service and other sort of means using mobile money like we're seeing in Kenya and essentially leapfrog an entire generation of very expensive um, sort of technologies that took many, many years to implement uh, that were much more kind of complex to do. And so that's one of the opportunity areas. And that's a huge, huge opportunity area because every, um, in developing countries, I mean, developed countries, it's getting all the data and all the information out of those legacy systems and transitioning is a very difficult, very time-consuming, very expensive thing. 
So what you want to be thinking about is in every one of these areas, immediately leapfrogging and going over a lot of those sort of legacy sort of systems that we have. And we've seen good examples of this. Um, you know, the most famous one, one of them is certainly in, in Kenya and some other African countries with the use of mobile money through M-Pesa. But I also think uh, we're seeing a lot of examples in healthcare and other areas around the use of things like frugal innovation. Um, so I, I think if you look in, um, in many developing countries, they cannot afford the sort of very expensive healthcare systems that we have in the West, and so they're looking at much more frugal innovation systems, which is actually, you know, in India right now, there's a variety of major companies, what they've done is applied the Toyota production model to healthcare and said, how do we get healthcare, things like cataract eye surgeries or heart surgeries or maternity thing, and how do we get that cost radically down by only doing that and applying this sort of pr production method? And they're able to do it for a fraction of the cost that we see in the US serving millions of people. So those are a few of those opportunities. And I do believe that there's a lot of opportunities to work with a lot of the multinational companies and, and others who are very interested in expanding their markets in those worlds and also are interested in trying out a lot of these new sort of business models and technology models. So I think there's a, a huge amount of hope in, in many respects uh, for the developing world as, as long as it's that thinking is about leapfrogging directly to modern digital technologies and so forth. And when you think about the AI, oftentimes it said, well, it's gonna to be too expensive or we don't have the people. Well, AI will be built into all of these technology systems, everyone providing cloud services, software as a service and so forth. They're building AI into that. Not only that, but we're seeing all of these examples of where you can go use a MOOC and actually get educated there. So a, a guy I know is one of the top deep learning experts in the world. And he runs something called Fast AI. And what Fast AI is, it's a basically a massively open online course where he says if you've got a high school education and, um, and one year of coding, they can teach you deep learning. In, in a certain amount of time, which is pretty amazing. And he's now, been, he's now getting emails. I was with him, and he was getting emails from people all over the world, um, you know, whether it's in Africa, in India, and elsewhere, who basically took the course and got incredible jobs, and they learned how to do this. So there's a lot of opportunities that would not have been present before that I think enable that. It's going to be really important, um, you know, again, that the governments provide an enabling environment for all of this. But thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. We can take one more question, maybe. Dr. Eggers, uh, fantastic presentation. Oh, thank you. Very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, just want to understand from you, how is the government in the U.S. gearing up for what you say is a predictive economy? India itself is transforming very rapidly uh, at a, an unprecedented pace, perhaps, but there would be some nuggets from that. Thank you. Yeah, and I, um, I, I, it's, it's always w when I go to, you know, whether it's India or China and elsewhere, and I talk about how to scale, and typically social enterprises and others that are able to scale to 10 million, 20 million people, it's incredible. But in India, the government always says that's not nothing. We gotta get up into the hundreds uh, of millions. Um, I, I think that we're seeing different governments take very different approaches to all this around the world. Um, so in China, China said that they're going to be putting $100 billion into AI. Uh, the government's very, very engaged in all of these technologies, whether it's CRISPR, whether it's AI, working with startups and so forth. Um, and so that's one model, okay? Very different model. What we're seeing in the US is a model where the private sector is in many respects taking the lead. Again, if you look at Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, um, and you know, a few other companies, that's 50, 60 million a year in R&D. And so a lot of these are much more around public-private partnerships and how can government use R&D? How does government create the right regulatory environment? So the White House is spending a lot of time kind of 
looking at the regulatory environments and making sure around each of these different areas that the regulatory environment is favorable to the emerging technologies, and in fact it wasn't in some cases, but you know, around these areas it's certainly going to be um, the private sector taking the lead in the US. And then you've got other countries like UK, which is a little bit in, in between in, in many ways. I will say though that um, you know, there are big efforts uh, in governments I've worked to around the world to try to look at what are these opportunities to automate around manual and free up people to work on more high value tasks, but I think it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty early in many respects. You know, the private sector is certainly a uh, number of years ahead in, ahead in the use of cognitive technologies, but I found just in the last year um, pretty, pretty remarkable increases in at least understanding of, of those issues. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you so much. Thank you.